I looked around the room with all the sad, tear-stained faces that were in it. Their grief did not surprise me at all. My husband, Dave, was a wonderful father, a successful businessman, a great supporter of our community, and a loyal friend. As a husband, he was the best. He was willing to do his share of household responsibilities, fully supportive of my desire to remain a stay-at-home mom, and, in recent years, of my desire to limit my activities outside the home to church roles and volunteerism. He was a much more attentive father to our three children, Molly, Derek, and Anne, than most men, and this was reflected in their successful lives after they left our nest. Well, Molly and Derek left. I'm sure Anne was on the doorstep. I looked around at the sad faces of my children. They all looked devastated, even the usually reserved Derek. And I? I was still in shock from the suddenness of Dave's death and trying to accept that the man I had loved unconditionally for 32 years had gone golfing one sunny Saturday morning and never returned. His lifelong Frian and our family lawyer, Jack, who sat at the heed of the large oak conference table next to his secretary, was the one who told me. It looks like Dave hit the ball and just fell over. The results of the medical examination had not yet been made public, but according to Jack, Dave was dead before he hit the ground. They performed CPR on him, but by the time paramedics arrived and attached a defibrillator to him, his heart was no longer defibrillable. He was pronounced deed upon arrival at the hospital. By the time Jack managed to find me, my cell phone was turned off. He had already told all three of our children, and they were all in the hospital before me. That was just four days ago, and I think we're still a little stunned. Jack opened the folder in front of him, took a deep breath, and began to speak. I thank you all for coming today to the reading of the will of the late David Brown, husband, father, and best friend I ever had. Jack was clearly quite emotional. There were dark shadows under his eyes, and his voice sounded as if his throat was lined with gravel. Apparently that's why his wife, Julie, was in the office that day. She was one of my friends and had been since she met Jack shortly after my wedding. Our relationship cooled a little about ten years ago, but I still considered her a friend. I saw her hugging her husband in his office as they led me into the conference room where all the children were already sitting. Here and now I watched as he took a deep breath and prepared to become the professional I knew him to be. I know this may seem like a departure from the standard practice of reading a will before the funeral, but as I will now reveal, this was Dave's expressed wishes. I must note, however, that this is quite unusual and nothing can be ratified until after the full term of inheritance. And now to the point. Then he began to read the will itself. I didn't need to listen because Dave and I always updated our wills together. I knew that at the top of the list there were specific items that Dave wanted, specific people to receive. Derek, our middle child and only son, was to receive Dave's medals for his service in the Army Corps of Engineers, or sappers, as Dave liked to call them. It was then that he developed his love for explosives. His collection of rocks was to go to Molly, our eldest, and so on. After disconnecting, I looked around at the gloomy faces of my children. Molly, just 30, seemed to accept everything stoically, even though she had always been close to her father. When I entered the room, I left her alone because I saw her looking at the wall with a tear in her eye. I could remember her and Dave talking about those stones many times. She began a promising career in science until she accidentally became pregnant by her boyfriend about a year after they met. Luckily, he was a good guy and did the right thing by making her an honest woman. They had been married for five years and seemed happier than ever. Two wonderful grandchildren for Dave and I to spoil. Derek, at 28, followed in his father's footsteps and was an engineer by day and an army reservist in his spare time. How long it would last was in question, though. His wife of two years was eight months pregnant with their first child. With the father as a hero, I'm sure the baby will be named David if it's a boy. I'm sad that my Davy won't be around to spoil the first grandchild to bear his last name. Derek looked at Jack. I felt sorry for him. He looked like he had aged five years in those four days since his father died. The skin is pale, the eyes are red, 
and my baby was officially a mistake. Dave and I decided that two children was enough, but we weren't confident enough to do anything drastic like sterilize either of us. Birth control pills always interfered with my hormones, so we relied on condoms. One of them must have failed, because ten years after Derek, Anne showed up. Dave then had a vasectomy. Anne was about to start college, and like most people her age, she didn't yet know what she wanted to do. During the summer, she helped Dave with his demolition business. She was still living at home, but she was spending more and more time at her boyfriend's house, and I knew it was only a matter of time before I was left alone in the house. This got me thinking about home. I should either consider downsizing from six bedrooms to something smaller or hire a housekeeper and gardener to help me. Between our bank account and Dave's life insurance, I knew I would live comfortably for the rest of my life. I half-directed my attention back to Jack's voice. As we agreed, Dave left his Mustang to Anne and his trusty old Jeep to Derek. The business was to be transferred to a trust run by the children, with all three acting as a board of directors with equal voting rights. Derek could run it if he wanted for a generous salary. It was fair. I knew nothing about business and did not need income. I tuned out again as more business management details were read out. Fond memories of Dave and our life together helped me cope with the shock of losing him. He was a remarkable man who pulled himself out of poverty and created assets out of nothing that left us survivors with little need. Suddenly, my third ear picked up a slight dissonance in Jack's words. Sorry, what did you just say, Jack? Looking annoyed, Jack turned the page he was reading back and began rereading the paragraph I had missed. The house is to be sold, and all profits placed in a trust administered by Jack Purcell to be used solely at his discretion for the education of my grandchildren by Molly White, B. Brown, Derek Brown, and Ann Brown. To this trust will be added all the funds of my personal bank accounts, and said Jack Purcell is given my power of attorney to access these accounts. He is also authorized and instructed to cancel all credit cards issued in my name. At this moment, my head was spinning. We deviated greatly from the script for the will that Dave and I updated in this very office just two years ago. What the hell is going on? Did Dave secretly change his will to something different than what I knew? And, according to the beneficiary designation form provided to the insurance company, the entire amount of my death insurance is to be paid to Miss Jennifer Sarah Jardine of 12 Pedley Court, Summertown. Suddenly I stood up without making a conscious decision to stand up. My body was on autopilot. Bank accounts emptied, house sold, insurance payout. To whom? My husband's secretary? I think I shouted something like, What the hell? There was dead silence in the room. The tension was palpable. I stared at Jack's familiar face. He was looking straight at me. There was an expression of disgust on his face. I recoiled. To avoid this look, I looked to the right, right into his secretary's eyes. I didn't know her at all. She was new since the last time I was here. The look of contempt on this stranger's face was perhaps even worse than the look on Jack's face. Turning away from both, I was forced to look at my children. Anne and Molly looked at the table indifferently. Even their poses were mirror images of each other, heads bowed, shoulders tense, hands folded on knees, white knuckles. Derek was the only one who looked at me. Looked is not the right word. He stared at me with such depth of anger that I wished with all my heart that he too would look at the table. Suddenly a cold thought appeared in my head. Did they really know? In my last moments of clarity before emotions took over, Logic provided the answers that the desire for hope had suppressed. Dave knew. He told Jack and changed his will. Now the icy welcome I received when I entered that torture chamber made complete sense. Jack must have warned my children before I arrived. Call me a coward if you want, but I turned around and ran out of the room. Julie was still in the office, sitting at the reception desk, talking on the phone. Oh, how I needed a friend right now. I approached her. I was only two steps away when her words penetrated my overheated brain. If you check your records, you will see that his wife's cell phone was on the contract in his name. Now he is dead. 
but if you give me your fax number, I can send you the power of attorney that my husband received for all his affairs. I watched in shock as she wrote down the number on the legal pad in front of her. She still hadn't noticed my presence when she thanked the person on the other end of the line and hung up. When she put the phone down, she stood up, placing a chair between us. The look of disgust on her face was devastating. Jack showed me some pictures that Dave left in a sealed envelope to show your children. You just make me sick. I hope sex with your young lovers was worth ruining one of the best men I've ever known. With these words, she walked into the conference room. I watched as she walked around the huge table and hugged her husband. If I wasn't mistaken, he was trembling. Nobody looked in my direction. No one cared about my devastation. Feeling more alone than ever, I left. As soon as I was outside, I heard the sound of a text message arriving. It was from Jack, and it said that it was Dave's expressed wish that I should not attend his funeral. How I got home without losing my mind, I will never know. I sat on the sofa in a stupor. I thought Dave loved me with everything he had. Of course, our sex life has suffered over the last ten or so years, gradually dwindling to nothing. But hey, neither of us were young anymore. And after 32 years, who could blame us? Crap. About 10 years ago? Could it be 11? Julie's words an hour ago echoed in my frayed brain. I hope sex with your young lovers was worth ruining one of the finest men I have ever known. Lovers. In plural. Oh my God. Dave knew not only about Justin, but also about Mario. No, this couldn't happen. Mario was many years ago. It's impossible for Dave to stay with me this long and not say anything. No, he could only know about Justin, and Julie made a mistake in the heat of the moment. Yes, it was like that. However, even this knowledge shocked Dave enough to cut me out of the will and, worst of all, tell my children. What hatred made him go to such extremes? It was too much, so I grabbed a bottle of gin and filled a highball glass. My hands were shaking violently. The burning sensation in my throat calmed me a little. How could Dave do this to me? I still loved him. My God, did Dave know that I still loved him? Was part of his problems in bed that he thought I was going to leave him? Now that I think about it, it has actually gotten colder in the last year or so, but I've been too busy to put it all together. I realized that I had subconsciously justified his withdrawal emotionally as shame because of his problem. Tears began to flow again, threatening to spill over. I blinked to shoo them away. I needed to think. I wonder how Dave could live with someone like me for the last year and a half. The pain in my chest was physical. I pressed my hands to my ribs as if they could stop my soul from being torn apart. Torn by the pain and fear that Dave must have been feeling for some time. He thought I didn't love him or, worse, was going to leave him. Why else would he go to such extreme measures to destroy me so completely? Wrong, 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 Dave, I screamed into the empty room. I've never loved you less. It was just sex with others. I never wanted to hurt you and I would never leave you. I collapsed back onto the sofa, devastated by the sheer certainty. Dave died without knowing this. My mind went into nirvana for a while, probably for self-preservation. Rita, are you there? It was the voice of my sister, Mary. The chirping of gravel against the open upstairs window, along with her screams, woke me from my hungover sleep, fully clothed on the master bed. I staggered to the window, looking out vaguely, then stumbling down to let her in through the back door. She and her husband have been on a cruise for the past ten days. As far as I knew, she didn't even know that Dave was no longer with us. Rita, are you okay? I heard about Dave, poor thing. Why aren't you answering the phone? Waking up again and reminding myself of my loss, her questions overwhelmed me. Without a word, I let her inside, walked over to where my cell phone was charging, and tried it. Dead. I sank into one of the kitchen chairs and burst into tears as it all came back. Mary sat down next to me and took my hands in hers. Oh my God, how could they leave you alone like that? Wait, I'll call Anne. Why isn't she here? Just as she reached for her phone, my loud no stunned her into immobility. She sat there while I collected the remains of myself and mentally prepared myself to lose the respect of my sister, along with the rest of the world. 
Finally, do you remember that time about 11 years ago when Dave was working for that medical examiner in the ACT? You know, after that girl died during that demolition job? Mary nodded. I was very proud at the time that my husband was considered an expert enough in his field to be called upon as an assistant investigator. Dave has been away for almost two weeks. Well, damn, that was harder than I thought. Mary was my little sister and always looked up to me with admiration. There was this young guy, he was on the same church committee as me, and we, uh, flirted a little earlier. Mary frowned at me but remained silent. Well, while Dave was in Canberra, I agreed to have dinner with this guy, Brian, that was his name. He was about 28 and a good-looking guy, if you know what I mean. I had two or three glasses of wine with dinner, and... Mary's face looked horrified and my courage almost deserted me, but I took a deep breath and continued. I sought solace in the memories of this time. I was paying for my infidelity at the moment, and although the logic was twisted... The memories of the fun I had in breaking my marriage vows were the coins that made up for the cost. Oh, Mary. Brian was very energetic. He took me to his house and had sex with me over and over again. The guy was wonderful. Rita. Oh, my God, stop it. Are you here to relieve your soul or to boast about the joys of extramarital sex? At her reproach, my face turned red with shame. I apologized for going off topic and returned to a rather subdued account of my all-night adventure with Brian and how I didn't get home until the next day. Mary was shocked that I betrayed Dave in a drunken delusion, but she was even more shocked when I continued to tell him how, having calmed my conscience, I returned to him again and again. It only stopped when Brian became blind in an accident at the school where he taught chemistry. He was working alone in a laboratory when a glass vessel he was heating exploded. The combination of flying debris and the corrosive liquid in the flask rendered him blind in both eyes. He wore regular glasses instead of the required face shield. After that, I lost contact with him. Mary sat stunned throughout my entire story. And when did your affair end? This affair ended just over ten years ago? This sentence hung between us for many seconds. This novel? Uh, yeah. Oh, Mary. You wouldn't believe how a girl's ego gets boosted at our age by having someone on her side, someone young and attractive and, uh, energetic, if you know what I mean. I fell into an awkward silence, praying that Mary wouldn't elaborate on what I thought she was thinking. And I'm guessing, judging by the smug look on your face, the sense of superiority you felt from deceiving Dave was a factor. My little sister has always been smart. She proved it again. I have often wondered if part of my motivation for finding a replacement for Brian a little over a year after his injury was due to the internal feelings of inferiority I felt in comparison to my husband. I remembered that moment. Sure, I wasn't a successful businessman like Dave, but I was a brilliant parent. Then it occurred to me, as if it were yesterday, Dave was both a brilliant parent and a successful businessman, I always knew, deep down, that this was probably the motivation for what I continued to do. I, uh, don't know. Maybe. I definitely didn't want to hurt him. But you went out and found someone else, didn't you? I looked down at the table in shame. Yes. And this guy was young and strong too, wasn't he? My silence was all that was needed. Tell. Well, Michael wasn't entirely my fault. Around this time, Dave started having problems with the, uh, performance side. I felt like I wasn't turning him on anymore, no matter what I did or how hard I tried. I was still in the prime of my sexual powers, and it hurt. Stop this cheap self-justification, Rita. Get to the point where you go and find another guy to satisfy you. It wasn't just about sex, Mary, I countered. Michael was a good guy. He was romantic and smart. We always had a great time. And how long did Michael last? Until he got tired of seeing someone old enough to be his mother? Until he wanted to settle down and have children with someone his own age? God, how awkward that was. Uh, no. Michael died about five or six months later. Died, how? I never found out exactly. He invited me to a barbecue. He was going to cook me one of his famous burgers. 
Then, after some time in the bedroom, he was going to take me with him to introduce me to some of his friends at a football game. Me. Uh, did what I usually do, parked in a shopping center parking lot about two blocks from his house, and walked to his place. When I got to his house, there were firefighters everywhere, and the house was partially destroyed and completely engulfed in fire. I had no choice. I went home. Michael did not answer the phone, and the next day the newspaper reported that the owner of the house had died. I returned two days later and talked to the neighbor. Everyone seemed to think that Michael was trying to light the barbecue and the gas cylinder exploded. Oh, Mary, it was terrible. Yes, I can imagine. Losing a friend can be traumatic. Yes, that too. But it could have been me. If Michael had waited until I got there to light the barbecue, I might have died too. Besides, the investigators were still there, and the neighbor introduced me as Michael's acquaintance. They questioned me as if the explosion wasn't a terrible accident. I convinced them that I couldn't help, but I lived in terror for the next few months that they would find out more and somehow Dave would find out. Don't look at me like that, Mary. I know you think I'm a serial cheater and maybe even that I'm a selfish bitch, but I just wanted to protect Dave and my family from the consequences. I fell silent, remembering the extreme fear of that time, many years ago. So you returned to your duties as a conscientious wife and mother after that? I doubted whether I should dwell on this moment of my confession, but I could not. The fact that I turned out to not know my husband as well as I thought, so much so that he successfully hid his knowledge of my infidelities for God knows how many years seriously shocked me. I am a Christian, but not a Catholic. I could not find consolation in confession, and the idea of easing my soul in front of a stranger was disgusting. About three years, yes. Mary just looked at me without emotion. Again, Mary, I don't think it was entirely my fault. Dave's erectile dysfunction got worse and worse. Oh, he tried, but he couldn't, if you know what I mean. And it changed him. He continued to stay late at work and work weekends. He was still great with the kids, but being with me seemed to make him feel embarrassed or something. Then there was all the fun I was missing, you know, in the bedroom. So I went and found a replacement for Michael. His name was Jerome. He looked like a real stud, you know, the type. Muscles on top of muscles, a gym freak. But I gotta say, he was a bit of a disappointment in bed. It only lasted six weeks or so, and I was going to break up with him, but before I could, he disappeared. Disappeared? Yes. I went to his house one day, and it was empty. Everything was packed and gone. It was a little bitter between us. I thought he had real feelings for me and that he would at least call to say goodbye, but no, he just up and left. I haven't heard from him since. This time, when I paused, Mary's raised eyebrow was all I needed to continue. I, uh, met Mario not long after that. He was the best in bed, I mean. He couldn't make love if he tried. He just took me whenever he wanted. Oh, Mary, you won't believe how exciting this is. It was like being back in high school. Mary's renewed look of disgust made me miss the details. Mario was a bad guy, or so he tried to seem. Said he was involved with tough guys in Melbourne. Anyway, he started to get quite pushy. Said that my insistence on meeting only in private was interfering with his social life, and insisted that we could go out with his friends. I went once to a bar on the other side of town, but spent the whole evening terrified that someone would see me. In addition, he began to resent the fact that I had to use condoms. I didn't want to risk my health this way. I knew that Mario had other girls besides me. I tried to break up with him after that, but I just couldn't. I think I became addicted to sex. I called him a week or so later, and he must have missed my body as much as I missed him, because he agreed that I could come to him next Friday. And how long did good old Mario continue to please you after that? Did you find out he wasn't full of crap? Let me guess, you came to see him on Friday and all his mafia buddies were waiting for you. My humiliated expression seemed to make Mary soften her sarcastic tone a little. I remembered this time with pain. No, I never went to see him that Friday. His sister, who I became friends with, called me Thursday night and asked if I had watched the news. I hadn't. Mario died in a car bombing. Apparently he really got involved with the wrong people. It shook me to my core. Then again, it could have been me. 
Mary watched as tears welled up in my eyes. She didn't hug me. I couldn't blame her. Even I didn't know if it was pity for my former lover or memories of fear from that time four and a half years ago. She allowed me to calm down. Was he the last one, Rita? Now comes the most difficult confession. Now Mary finds out that while my husband was receiving CPR on the golf course, I was having fun in a cheap motel with my latest lover, happy that my phone was safe, hidden in my car in the parking lot of another shopping center. So I was one of the last to know about Dave's death. No, Mary. Unfortunately, Mario wasn't the last. God, how hard it was. I was good for over two years this time. Then I met this new guy who started working on the church committee, Justin. Not Justin Smith? Crap. I forgot that Mary was on some committees with Justin, just like me. Somehow, the fact that she knew him made it all infinitely worse. But he was married and had two small children. Shame caused me to miss the obvious hint I had just received. I tried to break up with him. He became too intrusive. He started saying that we were made for each other. He said that he would leave his wife and everything else. I began to be afraid of what he would say to Dave to separate us. I could not sleep for the last couple nights, worrying that he might have emailed Dave or called him. Someone told me that shortly before Dave left, he received a call. What if it was Justin? And that's what triggered his heart attack. Finally, I found the strength to look at Mary's face. All the blood was gone from him. Her mouth opened, but nothing came out. I was confused. Finally, oh my God, you don't know, do you? Know that? Justin is dead, Rita. He died the day before Dave. Someone sent his wife a letter saying he was having an affair and she kicked him out of the house. He immediately went to the garden shed and apparently set a fire himself. I was amazed. I was isolated in my grief for the first four days after Dave's death and drunk since the reading of the will yesterday. Or was it the day before yesterday? Apparently everyone who came to offer me their condolences this week didn't want to burden me with the bad news of the local gossip. I looked at Mary's face again. If possible, it has become even paler now with hints of green. He knew, she whispered, shaking her head. All this time he knew. Who knew what, Mary? Dave, think about it. Don't you see a pattern? What pattern? What are you talking about? Mary looked at me with irritation. He knew, Rita. Dave knew about all your lovers. I shook my head, unable to speak. No, 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 my inner voice screamed. The pain of realizing that Dave knew about all my infidelities was too great. Every time I shook my head, Mary nodded. Even in my stress, I remembered our childhood arguments. Those infantile, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. Which continued until mom or dad told us to shut up. Yes, Rita. He knew about each and every one of them. Think about it. Your first lover, Brian. Blinded when something exploded in the chemistry lab. Who was next? Michael, I whispered. That's right. Michael. Died when a gas canister exploded the day you were planning to go out with him to a public football match. That Jerome guy who disappeared without a trace. Mario, shortly after you started going out in public, bang, died in a car bomb. Now Justin, he may have been about to reveal your affair, but no. Boom, again, he's dead. Don't you see? You must. You can't be that blind. Mary snorted at my silence. What was Dave's profession, Rita? How difficult would it be for a guy with his experience in explosives and pyrotechnics to set off multiple targeted explosions without leaving evidence? If anyone knew how to make any of these explosions look like an accident, it was Dave. I was unable to speak as everything Mary said took in my exhausted, hungover head. It all made an ugly, terrifying sense. If I'm right, and I'm sure I am, Rita, Dave knew about your exploits from the first. He was either pretending to have problems in bed to avoid sex with you, or he really was having difficulties. He was keeping an eye on you, you and your lovers, and when there was a possibility of your adventures becoming publicly known, and thus he would have to act, he took action. But that can't be true. He would have collided with me. I protested weakly, still trying to cling to my illusions. What? And risk destroying his family? You know better than I that family was the most important thing in his life. No, he would have waited until Anne left the house before taking such a step. 
The puzzle pieces fit together so well that I knew they were true, just how unpleasant it was. The man I thought loved me completely was preparing to trap me in the near future once our nest was empty. It was the most devastating confidence I've ever experienced. I was only vaguely aware of Mary standing up. Her voice shocked me as she spoke, standing between me and the back door. I shuddered. I'm leaving, Rita. I know you need me, but frankly, you disgust me. I would never have believed it if I hadn't heard it from you yourself. Besides, I have to cook dinner for Pete. With these condemning words, she left. I don't remember the next few hours. The next thing I remember was darkness. I woke up from quiet sounds from the bathroom. Curious and a little scared, I got up and went there. Anne stood there holding a clear plastic bag containing Dave's hairbrush. What the hell? Anne, honey, you scared me. Why do you do that? I asked, pointing to the brush. She looked at me with a poisonous expression. I took a step back. Because, Mom, something Dad asked me years ago made sense to me today. I was completely taken aback by her answer and hurt by her expression. What? When I was about eight, my dad took a DNA sample from me. He said it was to test for genetic weaknesses. I believed it then, but today it dawned on me. I think he wanted to check if I was really his biological daughter. Now I want to check it too. Anne looked at me as the implications of that statement dawned on me. Brian was my first lover after marriage, but Dave didn't know about it. By the time I came to my senses, it was too late. A glance out the window showed Anne dragging two suitcases down the front walkway. She turned to walk along the street. I ran outside, but not before I saw and heard my husband's old Mustang drive away. I have never felt so completely alone in my entire life. I used logic to hold back the destructive emotions I felt swirling around, trying to find a way into my head and blow it up. I analyzed everything I could remember about Mary's logic, desperately wanting to believe that Dave couldn't have known this for 11 years. The only proof of my desire was my belief that he was too open and honest to hide his knowledge from me. The Dave I knew couldn't fake that kind of love. An unpleasant memory came unbidden. The day before the will was read, I was rummaging through Dave's closet for a suit for the funeral home and thought he had more clothes. I jumped up from the couch, ran upstairs to the master bedroom and threw open the closet again. Of course, the remaining clothes were placed on hangers to create the illusion of volume. Dave would sneak his clothes out of our house. I realized with a shock that when Anne finally flew out of the nest, Dave must have been right behind her. The only burning question burning in my soul was, how long has he known? Mary's words came back to me and formed a clear, undeniable pattern. The answer was 11 years. With terrifying certainty, I now accepted that Dave's sexual problems were not physical. Somehow he found out about Brian and didn't want to have sex with me anymore. It was terrible. 49 at that time, practically give up sex at this age, simply because your wife was not strong enough to resist the temptation of passionless monkey sex with a young guy. But 11 years. Why? The answer came to me instantly. This was exactly the kind of person Dave was. In his opinion, he made a mistake by marrying me, but three lives were created from that marriage. Three innocent lives. Dave would feel that they shouldn't have to pay for his poor judgment. It was his responsibility. Walking away from the marriage would have jeopardized the emotional well-being of his children, and he would never do that. When I met Brian, Molly was 19, Derek was 17, and little Anne was only seven. A cold shiver passed through me. He intended to stay there until the nest was empty, and then, having fulfilled his duty, what? Where were his clothes? I cannot explain the depth of my shame and disappointment. Yes, I said disappointment. I took extreme precautions to hide my affairs. Mary's logic implied that he somehow found out about Brian. The time he had performance issues proved that. If he had stood up to me, the facade of a happy family would have been destroyed forever. The well-being of children is at risk. Without being able to take out his anger on me, would he lash out at Brienne? I couldn't reconcile the Dave I knew with someone who could hurt another person. It's much easier to convince myself that Brian's fate was an accident, as I always thought. Once it became known what I was capable of, 
Dave began looking for relapses. How did he feel when he discovered Michael? Devastation is probably not a strong enough word. My soul sank at the thought of him tracking my movements and behavior while maintaining his tough facade to the rest of the world. He buried his disappointment in me and hoped that I would not do anything to give myself away and show the rest of the world that he was a cuckold. If Mary was right, and I instinctively knew she was, Dave had been watching Michael and I closely enough to know when we were about to enter into a relationship where the risk of detection was high. Dave acted to protect my reputation and thus his family. But could he kill? I couldn't believe he would do this. It is much more likely that the gas cylinder explosion was intended only to injure, like Brian. The three-year break after Michael must have been a blessing for Dave, but his continued avoidance of sex with me proved that he had already passed the point of forgiveness. And then, again, shocking disappointment when his surveillance discovered Jerome. Loneliness, from hearing, seeing, reading all the evidence of my betrayal, and not having a single soul he could trust. I was pretty careless with Jerome. We were doing this in the office, Jim one day, right before Jerome. Again, a pattern that Mary immediately noticed said, How could I have missed this? Dave ignored the threat to his family until the chances of detection reach at a point only he knew. I wonder if Jerome's bones will ever be found or if he was simply made an offer smart enough to follow, disappear without looking back, or how Dave's opinion of me could have sunk even lower when Mario showed up with what seemed like unreasonable haste. Was Dave at the bar when I first showed up with Mario? Was he sweating from the threat of my exposure? Was I not the only one who was afraid of seeing familiar faces? For glances that lingered too long? If only Dave had known about my decision to never go out in public with Mario again, or my continued insistence on using condoms. So I could save his soul from the stain of murder for the second time, or was it the third time? The three-year gap between Mario and Justin must have been a relief for Dave. Did he have any hope of surviving until the empty nest and his departure without additional sacrifice? Did he have anyone by then who could share the debate about whether it was enough for Anne so as not to suffer emotionally from the fact that he will reveal my shame and destroy the family? Regardless, I knew Justin knew well enough not to feel bad enough about destroying his family to kill himself the way they said he would. His agonizing last seconds on earth as he entered his barn and Dave's trap are not worth thinking about. This time I hoped and prayed that there was no afterlife. Dave deserved his happiness ever after, but after the actions I forced him to. All the logic and theorizing made sense after three large glasses of gin. What hasn't subsided are my thoughts about Dave's loneliness throughout this time, and my frustration that I'll never know what triggered him in the first place. When did he first find out? How exactly did he know? And the worst thing? When was the first time he said, I love you, and lied? The gin bottle was empty when my sense of shame finally turned into terrible remorse as I realized that I, myself, was the one who killed or maimed those men. Not Dave. Dave was just a tool. If I had been strong enough to keep my legs together, or at least modest enough to keep my infidelities a secret, every one of my former lovers would be alive or intact today. Devastated, I grabbed a bottle of bourbon. I was still drunk three days later when Derek called me to remind me that I shouldn't show up to his father's funeral. I got the impression that he drew the short straw. After he told me the news emotionlessly, he hung up. Ulcer after ulcer, I went out onto the porch and took three days of newspapers. Here it is. Dave Brown's funeral is at three o'clock today. Everyone was invited to the service, but the burial was private. I couldn't be sober enough to drive, but I went anyway. I didn't want to make a scene, so I stayed away from the grave and watched from a distance. I couldn't pass up the opportunity to apologize to Dave's soul, apologize and ask how he knew about my affair with Brian. A bottle of something sweet and sticky kept me warm and in a warm daze. The sight of Jen, Dave's longtime assistant, playing the role of a grieving widow was like being stabbed. Seeing my three children comforting her made me realize that they knew she was more than just a helper to Dave. Like a dramatic heroine, she fell to her knees as the coffin was lowered into the grave. 
Derek helped her up and supported her. She and my children were the last to leave the grave. I was shaking as I walked closer, ready to say goodbye. Before I had time to close my eyes in the hope of feeling Dave's spirit, I heard an unbearable scream behind me. Turning around, I saw St. Jennifer rushing towards me with her fingers extended forward like claws. I stepped back as she was held back and pulled aside by Derek and Anne. Molly stayed behind as a rear guard. She was about to leave without saying a word when I spoke. What's this bitch complaining about? She has a million of my dollars from Dave's life insurance. Who calls who a bitch? This woman's love kept my father alive these last few years. Dad left us a letter. When his strength to bear your bullshit finally ran out, she was the one who was there for him. I owe her the last years of his company. But why does she hate me? You can't be that clueless. Molly looked at me intently. Or maybe you are. She blames you for taking the love of her life away from her. She told her dad that she had been in love with him for a long time, only a few years ago. However, their relationship remained platonic until you didn't go back to her lecherous ways with that guy Justin. Even then, it was a long time before he agreed to sleep with her. She said you destroyed his sexual confidence and he had serious problems with her. She only found out after he died that he bought Viagra on the black market, and she is convinced that this is what caused his heart attack. With that, she turned around and quickly followed the rest of her family. I thought about chasing after her and telling her about my suspicions that her father was not the saint she thought she was, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. Everything Dave has become is something I caused myself. I couldn't destroy his children's memories of him when it was entirely my fault. Later, much later, I thought about Molly's words. Viagra? I remembered some of the things I'd done with my various lovers, then imagined Dave watching it on video. Memories of what I did to Justin to keep him interested in my aging body played out on the screen in my head. This would certainly destroy any husband's sexual confidence. It just kept getting better and better. I wasn't the only one who destroyed Dave's confidence in me and forced him to live a lie for 11 years. I wasn't the only one who essentially deprived him, being the kind of person he was, of the opportunity to give up his sex life for many years. Now I've learned that I left him with very real problems in bed, issues that contributed to his death. Crap. My bottle was empty, and I urgently needed a drink. The next two weeks passed in turmoil. I used all the cash we had at home to buy alcohol and mostly lived on canned food from the pantry. When I got around to checking my email, it was full of recent notifications from various utility companies. One day, the bailiff came with an eviction notice. I left a message for Jack asking him to let me stay. He never called back, and the process seemed to continue. Calls to my children went unanswered. Was I such a bad mother that they rejected me because of a personal issue between me and their father? Then I remembered the extent of my crime and the consequences it entailed for a good man and I felt that I would be lucky if my children ever spoke to me again. On the day of eviction, I was hungover. An arrogant man in a cheap suit acted like he was doing me a favor by letting me pack some things for a move. Eventually, I was escorted to my own doorstep and informed that a taxi had been booked to take me anywhere within an hour's drive. I remember standing there in a daze for a moment before Jack walked up to me and handed me an envelope, making it clear that he did not agree with its contents. I tore it up. A legal document and a typewritten page fell out. The page basically said that Dave had left me a small one-room apartment and a modest allowance that would keep me from starving to death. Oh, Dave, a good man until the end. The legal document was truly a deed of ownership. I threw the documents on the ground and looked into the envelope for an explanation from my late husband the one where he expressed his dissatisfaction with me for 11 years of betrayal, the one where he confessed how he found out about my first affair with Brian, the one where God has mercy, he forgave my sins. The envelope was empty. That's when the taxi arrived and honked its horn. I picked up the scattered documents and realized what they meant. What did the absence of a letter mean? Dave didn't bother to write me a letter. I was thrown back. I was unimportant. I was just a detail. 
I don't even think he made the provision for my future out of any sense of responsibility or duty. I think he just wanted to make sure I lived so I could suffer longer, experience what it's like to lose everything valuable, and be faced with a choice. Give up or try to build a different life. Thinking about how I ruined our marriage and destroyed the best man I ever knew. Phew. Thank God my colleagues were able to get her into the police car. Now if the others wait on the terrace while I talk to Mr. Burroughs, right? Yes. So, Mr. Burroughs, are you sure you don't want me to call an ambulance for these scratches? No, everything will be fine, thank you, officer. So, Mr. Burroughs, are you a medium? I prefer the term spiritist. What is the difference? About $20 an hour. Okay. Do you talk to the dead? Of course not. I'm just convincing a bunch of medieval idiots who were born yesterday and got paid today that I can. I'm giving them confidence that their departed loved ones are happy on the other side. They pay me 60 bucks an hour for that. The spiritualist suddenly realized that he had just admitted to cheating and fell silent abruptly, looking awkward. The policeman was of the old school. I guess we won't bother you about it. If a bunch of cows want to come to your doorstep and pay you to milk them, then why not, like I say? So what went wrong tonight? Well, Mrs. Brown Rita has been here for a couple of weeks. It usually takes that long to gather enough details about what they want to give them a convincing story. I learned that she was recently widowed and was having difficulty accepting the death of her husband. But to be honest, tonight I was going to focus on Mrs. Gillespie. I found enough of her story on Google to know what to say. Anyway, we all held hands and I did my eye roll. That always affects their wallets when I said that one of my constant spirit guides came to act as a guide to the next world. The scammer stopped to touch two long scratches on one side of his face. As soon as I mentioned the conductor's name, Dave, Mrs. Brown just exploded. She started yelling at me to tell her how he found out and other nonsense like that. I wanted to focus on Mrs. Is it bad? This week, and I wasn't prepared to guess why Mrs. Brown had come, so I said Dave was disappearing and another of my spirit guides was taking over. Mrs. Brown flew into a rage. She grabbed me by the throat and demanded that I forgive her. She said that guilt and loneliness were killing her. When I remained silent because I was amazed, to be honest, she began to wave her hands. She scratched my face. Crazy bitch. She smelled like alcohol. Are you going to arrest her? If you file a complaint and the other uh, members corroborate your story, I will. Yes. We'll get her out on bail, probably by mid-morning tomorrow. If you stop by the station on the way from the ER, they'll show you how to apply for a restraining order. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.